This is recording. Take a look at the screen. Tell me if I'm visible there. Hello? Almost. Right there. But this covers all the way, the whole thing. It covers the whole screen, right? The whole thing. Good. Cool. What are we going to teach tonight? I don't know. Um, last time, I believe, when I talked about the curriculum, Basic electrical things, Ohm's law, power equation. Rick Lapin talked about the first week, and I carried that a little further to say, okay, you have to apply a couple of other rules to make Ohm's law really work for you because sometimes you're not dealing with one voltage source, one load, and uh, that have a combination of things. So you have to you have to rationalize everything. Okay, so we'll cover the alphabet soup E I R X Z P and Q. That's voltage, current, resistance, and reactance, impedance, power. Didn't talk about Q, I'll try to pick up on that. Phase angle, I want to get into as we go further along. And the next session, which is this session, we will cover things that are called practical circuits. Alright. First practical circuit we talked about at a voltage source, the higher potential on one side, the lower potential on the other. And one thing I want to emphasize that I may not have spent enough time with last time is what Kirchhoff's law teaches us. What it says is voltages in a loop, sigma of all voltages from the first to the nth equals zero. If you add them all up, what goes up must come down. So if you have 10 volts here, you have 10 volts here. And those are going in opposite directions. So this is going up, and this is going opposite. So this subtracts from that, and they add up zero. If you had a circuit with more than one impedance, it really doesn't matter what kind of impedance. It could be these guys. And you had 10 volts here. You would have some voltage here, some voltage here, some voltage here. And these three guys added together also have to be 10 volts, even if it's 5, and 2, and 3, because you can't accumulate voltage in a loop. And that helps you when you get into a situation where there's not just one of these guys, but two of these guys. And you have to ask yourself, okay, I know what the voltage is, I know what the current is, 2 amps, let's say, and I know maybe one of these voltages, like, uh, say uh, this guy is, well, leave the voltage where it is, but let's say this guy is 3 ohms. 2 amps times 3 ohms is 6 volts. The amps times the resistance equals the voltage drop. I always emphasize voltage drop across that particular resistance. So you guess what you have here? You have 6 volts here. Well, if the voltages have to add up to zero, what has to be the voltage here? Obviously, four volts. Okay, if you've got four volts and two amps, what's the resistance? Four volts divided by two amps means this guy is a two ohm resistor. You were able to take something where there were multiple impedances in series and still solve the problem if you had just enough information. Knowing Kirchhoff's law, if you just had this guy by himself, 
home slot. It wouldn't be enough. So what I complain about when I read the book is that the book, meaning the, all the textbooks pretty much that teach you how to pass an AM radio exam, give you home slots, say now you know everything you need to know. You need to know a little bit more. Because if you have two, three, four cadences together, you need something to rationalize them, and this is the way you rationalize them, knowing that all the voltages have to add up to zero. Or conversely, you've got a parallel network, and you have to know that uh, all these impedances together might be 100 ohms. And this guy, well, Again, let's say, let's say it's uh, 200 volts. I'm trying to pick numbers that work, work well for us. Uh, you got the same two amps flowing here because this network together is 100 ohms. 200 volts over 100 ohms means you're going to get 200 volts. There's going to be some current times. Obviously, has to be what? Two amps again. All right, so if it's two amps, and I know that there's one amp going here, and there's half an amp going here, what does that have to be? It's got to be another half amp because, again, there's Kirchhoff's current law. All the current flowing into a node has to equal the current flowing out of the node. You cannot accumulate anything in the node. So if you've got two amps going in here, and you've got an amp flowing here, you have to have one amp flowing there. They cannot, you have to add the zero. They really do add the zero because this is going in and that's going out. It's going out. It's got the opposite side. It subtracts from what goes in. And therefore, the current version of this is all the currents added up. Um, I'm going to say, so then we're n equals 1 up to uh, some, some value like that. All those have to equal 0. You cannot accumulate current in the, in the loop. So I knew if I, had two, if I had to have two amps where 200 volts is flowing into an equivalent impedance of 100 volts. Ohm's low would tell me it's two amps. If I measure the current here and here, whatever's left over has to be what's flowing here. And that's how I applied that. And this, by the way, is a node. This is a node. So everything flowing into this has to flow out of these branches. Everything flowing from these branches into this has to flow out of here. A node is any junction between wires. That's a node because wires join here. That's a node even though it's spread out because all the wires join here. That's a loop because they're connected end to end, not in parallel. And that's just kind of refreshing a little bit of what I started with last week. We didn't have a good, uh, a good time a lot to finish. What we want to do now eventually is say, okay, so much of the basics, math, current, voltage, resistance, and the up above resistance, Impedance in general, which has reactants, reactants being the stuff that is exemplified either by an inductor or a capacitor. These guys are time variant, it matters whether you've got an AC or DC voltage applied to them, and it matters how rapidly that alternating current is alternating, going between going from zero to some positive maximum, back to zero, back to some negative maximum, and back to where you started. One cycle being wherever in the cycle you are starting it with, it's wherever it does the same thing you got. This is crossing the zero axis in a positive sense. This is going in a negative sense. This is going in a positive sense. It's going up, not down. So this to this is a full cycle. Let's build ourselves something useful. Let's call a power supply. Why would I pick something like a power supply? It just changes voltages. 
maybe a few other things. Uh, because in order to do that, you do a lot of things that are very, very exemplary. It tells you, uh, after you're through doing it, the answers to a lot of questions about how electricity works. To say, I can take what comes out of the wall, which I know is alternating current, 60 hertz, 120 volts, and turn it into something that electronics would use. And by the way, electronic devices, even though you plug your appliances into the wall, I'm talking about electronic appliances like a TV set, a VCR, one of those things over there. Internally, it doesn't run on alternating current, it runs on direct current. Every electronic circuit we're going to talk about, probably almost any that exists in the world, is fed with a direct current source. What you have to do is you have to convert the alternating current from your mains power source, that's what they call it in Europe and the rest of the world, mains power, um, to useful power for that electronic device. What does that is a power supply. Everything like a TV set or a radio or a um, computer uh, has a power pack or some kind of power source. Nowadays, they're getting really cute about this. Have you ever noticed that when you go on a trip and you got a little power pack that comes with your uh, PC, with your electric toothbrush, with your electric shaver, with whatever it is, if you read the readings on it, it says it will work from 100 volts to 240 volts. And the AC, that's AC. And that can be anywhere from 50 to 60 hertz. That covers essentially every power system in the world. So you can take your PC and plug it in in France. I'm going to be in France in, um, between the 6th and 14th of November, so it's, well, we won't have a class that particular week. But I'm bringing all my appliances, and, which means the PCs, cell phones, and I'm going to bring a power strip, which is six outlets, and I need just one converting plug that takes the so-called NEMA 15 format that we use for American outlets and converts it to the European two parallel pin format. When I was in Singapore, I did that with the British format, and in China, I used the Australian China format, which has these diagonal connectors. Around the world, you're going to find 240 volt 50 hertz is used mostly. I was in Israel from the 15th to the end of June, pretty much. And they used the European standard. But I didn't have to bring any power converters like I used to in the old days. Almost every electrical appliance that has an external power pack. They work around the world, all you have to do is get the right plug for it. The reason I use a power strip is I only need one plug. So let's build us one of those things. Okay, to do that, we got to do four things, typically. Maybe five, but four that I think are really essential. And they are transformation. We're going to have a transformer. The second thing is going to be called rectification. A rectifier is going to turn AC into DC. Transformer is going to change 120 volts to some other voltage, typically downward. Um, the third thing is going to be filtering. When you convert AC to DC, it's still bouncing around between zero and you know some peak value, and that produces a hum. And if you have audio equipment, if it's something like a battery charger, you don't care because you won't hear that. Um, the fourth thing you might be able to do is um, voltage regulation. So if you have a load that draws a lot of current or a small current, the voltage, if it's rated at 12 volts, will be consistently 12 volts. Otherwise, you pull more current and E equals IR takes over and the impedances along the way will drop the voltage so that as you draw more current, you get less to your load. The regulator takes care of that problem. It makes sure that what you get on the output is the same.
if you have a short circuit or something, you just don't want to draw excessive current for various reasons, you can actually set with a knob how much current that power supply is, can give at, any, at a particular voltage. So you set the voltage, you set the current. Now you're not telling it to deliver that much current, you're saying, because the current delivered depends on Ohm's law. Here's your voltage. Here's your load. The current you get still depends on the load. But if you have current limiting, it says if you pull too much current, it's going to lower the voltage, make sure the current never goes any higher than what you set it to for a limit. That's nice if you don't want to burn something up in case you have a short circuit in your, in your testing process. All right, step one. We want to change 120 volts AC, AC being the stuff that goes like that. And it does so from crest to crest from any equal point on the cycle. It will take, there's a wavelength, but basically this, rep, right, this frequency is going to be 60 times per second, cycles per second. There's an old term which we've now replaced with the term Hertz. Hertz is honoring the father of radio. And when we get to transmitters and receivers, I'll show you what his great contribution was. Um, that was done around 1970, I remember.